So I'm on a different computer. Um, so I can actually make this part of the presentation. So um, we're, I'll just, well, um, can everyone see my R Studio? Yes, okay. Um, yeah, just let me know if something goes wrong. I don't think I've, I don't know if I've ever shared my screen on this computer before. Um, and why, why am I using a different computer? Because um, it is very hard to get Keras to work on um, on a Mac, I discovered. Maybe it's just the, the M1 chip that uh, is really difficult, but um, I know, so one thing that we're not gonna talk about in depth is that um, there are different types, there are different um, deep learning frameworks, not really frameworks, but I mean, programs. And um, so one of them, I think the one that is currently the biggest is TensorFlow. And, and John actually um, is creating or has created a package that allows you to use TensorFlow from R. Um, but the way that, um, sorry, did I say TensorFlow? I meant PyTorch. I meant PyTorch. Yeah. And also uh -huh. you are correct when you say the framework, the planning framework, they are basically framework, all of them, TensorFlow, PyTorch. Yeah, I, yeah I, I think people the the, kid, the the cool kids call them like APIs. That's what the cool kids call them, um, because framework is a bit amb ambiguous because then within like, for example, TensorFlow, there's like a sequential mode and there's like a functional mode. People might refer to those as frameworks as well. So in any case, um, long story short, uh, it is not very fun to get TensorFlow slash Keras to work in uh, on a Mac. It's not even fun to get it to work on a Windows, but it's doable. Um, and the reason that you all are looking at a R Markdown instead of like a rendered, a knitted um, uh, HTML document is because whenever I try to knit this, uh, I get an error flow saying I don't have a valid instance of TensorFlow on my computer, which is weird because I can run all the code but when it comes time to knit, I, it, knitting doesn't work. So anyway, so um, that, that, that's that. Hardware, not fun. Um, our software, not fun. Hardware, software interaction, not fun. Okay, and so another thing we're gonna do today is I'm actually gonna run this code as we go through this um, because my I had to restart my computer kind of like emergency mode right before this. So this will be fun. Um, okay. I'm gonna just go really quickly through deep learning. Um, and in fact, I'm not even really gonna go through it, but feel free to ask questions. Um, but this book is not like a, an introduction to deep learning per se. Um, so that's why I'm gonna go through it quickly. Okay, so, so deep learning, what's up? what's up with deep learning? Why is it called deep learning? Uh, it's called deep learning because there are these hidden layers. So anytime you have this input layer, which these are our features, right? So this would be, we'd have four predictors in a model, for example. And anytime that we don't just go from those predictors to the output, but we have these intermediate hidden layers, we would call this, uh, it, this would be referred to. I mean, this is the essence of, of deep learning is having these hidden layers. And this is a very simple one because there are only four input features and there are only five hidden nodes. And there's only one layer of hidden nodes. So this would be a very simple model, but it's nice and illustrative of, of what it means for learning to be deep. Um, and like, what is what is learning here? So, you know, the second word in deep learning. Learning is basically assigning a numeric value to every single one of these arrows. So what this actually is here, what's going on here is there's actually a, basically a, a matrix, a, a weight matrix that transforms, not that the, the transforms, that yeah, that transforms these four inputs, it gets a linear function of these inputs and maps it to each one of these nodes. And so one thing that's different, one thing that's new uh, is that, you know, we have these five hidden nodes and each one of these is a linear function of these four. So that's pretty wild. And 
Uh, one thing that I didn't even I didn't incur it did not occur to me to to say until now is that these are A's. They have an A for activation functions. So there's also like weird transformations that go on in each one of these nodes. So you take a linear function of all the predictors, and then you transform that in some way. And so there's a like a, a hyperbolic tangent that to me is like the most fun one to say, but one that people use mostly now is a ReLU, um, which is a rectified linear unit. And it's actually just a very simple function that's zero for negative numbers and the linear function itself for uh, numbers above, uh, well, non-negative numbers. But we're not gonna uh, get into that in this, in this um, in this little presentation. And the very last thing I think I'll say about it is that like this, the, the way this thing is all laid out is referred to as a structure, as an architecture. Um, and so we're gonna learn three architectures over the next three chapters. And this one, the one that's pictured, and then the one that we're gonna talk about today is called a dense network. So it's a densely connected feed forward network. And that just means that basically all possible arrows are here. Uh, all possible unidirectional arrows are here. So you'll notice that every single one of the input uh, layer nodes maps onto every single one of the hidden layers, hidden layer nodes, and every single one of the hidden layer nodes maps onto the output layer. And it's feed forward because um, you can imagine that there's like a, another hidden layer here uh, to the right of the actually existing one. And then you have some kind of like recurrent that was actually a word that we'll see uh, in, I don't know if it'll be next week or just next um, next lesson, but uh, next presentation. But you can actually have nodes go back and uh, do fun things and have memory as it were. Okay, so that's deep learning. Um, super briefly, um, so TensorFlow is you know a bunch of code written in C++. Um, that you can access from Python. Um, so the Python, you'd say the Python is a front end uh, for TensorFlow and, you know, created by some fancy people at Google Brain. And, um, and you know, so, so that's nice. And to make it even nicer, I suppose, um, this, uh, this French fella here, I assume he's French, he could be Belgian, he could be Quebecois, I don't know. Um, or he, he could just be an imposter completely, I don't know. But anyway, he created what's called a high level API um, for various um, deep learning frameworks. So here, here are two that I have never seen people use, they all know CNTK, but um, the most prominent one is TensorFlow. And so just what does it mean to have a high level API? And I put that in quotes, uh, it, it means to minimize the number of user actions required for common use cases. So, which, I mean, so that makes sense. Why are we using Keras? Uh, because because we're, we're, we're novices, right? That's the idea. Maybe not, maybe you guys are experts. So, okay, so that's the general lay of the land. Um, now I'm gonna move on. If there are any questions, always, as always interrupt. Um, okay, so what is, the data. Um, I might spend a second on this just because I noticed that the data is going to be the same for the next three chapters. Um, so the data comes from Kickstarter. So I think some enterprising person, just uh, a person with a lot of time on their hands, likes to, to scrape Kickstarter blurbs. So um, so that's the, the text information we'll have. But first, just and what is what is Kickstarter? Um, Kickstarter is a way to crowdfund your projects. Um, and so here I, I took this maybe two weeks ago now. I don't know. It's just a screenshot of the homepage. Um, so here they were, um, you know, the featured project was some retrospective uh, about the, the Shining. Um, and so you can see here, you know, there are different categories. Um, I have no idea why certain ones are recommended for me. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, so if you click on one, right? So I just clicked on the, the main one. Um, you know, this one looks like pretty, this one was gonna be pretty successful. Successful, they, they a high budget like a uh, demo right there. And um, anyway, so you see that the goal is to, um, 
to meet some financial threshold. And then once that is met, um, the project will go through, will be realized, and people will get some sort of whatever they were promised. So in this case, I assume that they pledged a certain amount and are going to receive the thing that we are currently seeing. And so you see there are some number of backers, there's like a deadline, and, and you can choose to back it. Anyway, uh, this one is over. Yes, March 20th, it ended. Um, okay, so that's Kickstarter. Um, so notice here, and this is this is going to get uh, the data that we're working with. So a title, sorry, a project will have a title. So this one is The Shining, a visual and cultural haunting. And then there's the blurb. And that's the that's key piece of text we're going to be working with. So the blurb here, an immersive publication exploring the cultural history of Kubrick's The Shining, designed as a replica of Jack's fateful manuscript. So there you go. That's what it is. And we have, again, like I said, someone has been scraping this. So we have a lot of these blurbs. OK. Um, and I have a, a different data set than, than they have, so um, which is nice because we can get slightly different results and see how things go. So I'm just going to start doing this. So I have um, a bunch of zip files. And um, this will just take a second um, while I wait. So let's see. Some columns that we're going to have are state, blurb, created at, and country. Um, and well, actually, I'll just let the data speak for itself in a second. Um, as you can see, quite a few. It is a, we're trying to do deep learning, so we need a lot of data. So that's why there's so many. Okay, so uh, by the way, I will need someone to tell me. Um, if I have a second window, can people see that? Like, can people see the pop up, the pop out, or no? No, not unless you share your whole your whole computer. <clears throat> uh, I was hoping that since it was still our studio, it might might work. But um, okay, then let me. No, I'm gonna see. I'm just gonna try to do it here. This is pretty ugly, but. Say la vie. Okay, so state. So this is nice. So you can see that there are successful projects, there are failed, uh, and there's live. And there's actually another category that we'll see in a second. Uh, and so each one, we have the blurb. Um, notice here, this is going to be relevant. Here's one that's in French. Um, and we have created at, and we'll have to transform this to like a, a date time. Uh, object or column, and we see country. So here, US, Great Britain, uh, don't know, Sweden, maybe, um, uh, France, Australia. Okay, so um, if we actually look at country, um, man, I really wish it didn't do this. Um, okay, I'm gonna have to share my whole screen because this is, this is just getting unacceptable. Um, Let's see. Stop sharing. Okay. Let me know now if you can see. How about now? Can it can people see the pop-up? Yeah. Nice. Okay. So, um, so we see here, US by far most frequent poster of projects uh, with 97,000, basically 98,000. Then we have Great Britain, Canada, Australia. I assume this is Germany. Uh, it is Germany. Uh, and then we have France, blah, blah, blah. And somewhere down here, we've, then we've got uh, New Zealand. And so what I'm going to end up doing is subsetting this to places that are associated that are English speaking countries. So it's going to be these first four and New Zealand. Um, and that's just because we're, we're making a language model. So that kind of makes sense to me. Um, okay. So we'll do that in a second. And then we have this. Um, we have the five different states. 
So we have successful, failed, canceled, live, and suspended. Um, and one thing that I'm gonna do is just get rid of canceled, live, and suspended. And um, so subset basically to successful and failed projects. And we're gonna be building a classification model um, to predict success. Okay, so here's where all that happens. The, the filtering um, happens. And one thing that I'm also gonna do is um, create a, and whenever someone, and like whoever presents next week is gonna have to, to do this as well. Uh, you wanna make sure to have a binary numeric variable um, if you're doing like a two class prediction. Uh, I, I suffered a little bit um, because at first I had a, just a factor variable and Keras is not like that at all. So make sure you have a numeric variable for your, yeah. uh, for your, uh, go ahead. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, why do we need to do that? Because uh, maybe I made a mistake also in one of my work, like uh, I'm using uh, uh, the futures to be like positive, negative. So it would have been better in your main to put like one and zero, right? Do you have any explanation why it doesn't work in or it doesn't? Um, I mean, I just, the reason it doesn't work is that it's like a, a type error. Keras just requires that you have a binary variable, I'm sorry, a numeric variable uh, as okay. your categorical output. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, but yeah, like why they made that choice, I'm not sure, so. Um, Okay, so in the end, um, the data set is gonna look like this. Um, man, this is bizarre output. Um, but anyway, so we have success, ones and zeros, uh, blurb, and then um, created at, but now as a, as a daytime object. Although I'm actually not gonna use that as a feature. Um, so, so yeah, so that's it. And let's see how many observations we have, uh, a nice amount. So 116,000 uh, rows. Okay. Um, so here, this is interesting. So this is a, a distribution that uh, I, I don't see very much. Um, you see that there is a character limit on these. And there's something bizarre that happens here where um, they're like, it's pretty obvious that there's a fixed limit and this happens to be at this spike is at 135. And somehow some people snuck past it in kind of a bizarre way. Uh, so I'm actually gonna chop off these. I mean, this is like extremely few, these are extremely few observations. So I'm gonna limit to the ones that stayed under the, the limit. And something that they do in the book is that they require that a entry has at least 15 characters. Um, so I'm gonna do that subsetting. And now that's, that's the end of the working with the data. Okay, um, so now we get into the real, the real stuff, um, as it were. So this is um, tidy models stuff right here now, the very first tidy models code in the, in the lesson. So we're just gonna do a split, um, stratifying on success, and I'm gonna put 80% of the data in the training set. And then I get out the training set. Uh, and this is just a random comment, I suppose. Uh, one thing that I had, I didn't have to do on this computer, but just to help is like to not pull out a training set or sorry, the test set yet, because there's really no purpose in pulling them out at the same time. I'm not sure why people do that. Um, anyway, just random comment. So, okay. So the very first thing we have to think about that we've not had to think about so far in any of our models is um, the length in words of our documents. Now, when we have bag of words, for example, um, the data, the document term matrix or document feature matrix we get, um, it doesn't care about how long each document is at all. So we can have a lot of heterogeneity in the number of uh, words per document. Um, I mean, it's something we should think about, you know, but it's not, you know, the documents don't need to go into a straight jacket as far as number of words. Here they do, actually. So um, each document has to have the same number of, of words. And this is very much like um, if we were doing image processing, they would have to have the same number of pixels. Um, 
at least as far as I know, and all the, uh, the architectures I'm familiar with. So this is, we can think of it as our first hyperparameter is blurb length uh, or document length. In okay. The, um, so I have a question. So if, uh, for example, we go to um, real world scenario, for example, we want to find the comment of people in real world scenario, they may not have the same lens, right? And um, if, for example, we want to check about the opinion of people in the comment, positive, negative, if we chop uh, some length of particular comment, we may chop up the emotion content in that, right? So do you think this is a real way to model the stuff because uh, we may chop up the, some important ideas in what we chop up? Can we mod, uh, what do you think about this? Oh, I'm glad you asked. I, I have an opinion. <laughs> um, okay. So, so I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to that. So first of all, I, I guess in defense of the, the book or something, um, I mean, th this kind of is a real world application, right? I mean, I'm not particular, I mean, I'm not, not interested in using a model to predict Kickstarter success or failure, but it's not like the first thing I would, I would do on my own initiative. But I mean, someone could be interested in this. Someone at Kickstarter could be interested in this. Um, so, so I would say this is a real application and it's one where we should think about this. Um, and so, I mean, I, I'm just gonna go through what I prepared and if I didn't, don't answer your question, remind me. So the way that this is presented in the book slash the way I'm thinking about this is that, you know, we have a document length, I'm just gonna call it L. And so, I mean, that, that, that's a fixed number for our, in the entire uh, project. And so, well, it's a hyperparameter we can set. Um, but so for the, an individual document, right? If it's greater than L, the, um, what, I, what you can call the surplus words, that they're chucked out, they're removed. But, you know, that's a certain number of words. It could be 10 words, it could be five words, whatever. But the question is which words? So, the way that um, I did a good job of not writing what they did in the book. Now I see that. So the, the typical way you would do that is just um, truncate either what it's called pre or post. So let's say that our document length is 30 um, for the model and a specific document has 35. So if we do pre truncation, we would remove the first five words. If we did post truncation, we would remove the last five words. And that seems to be very standard, um, choosing one of those two. In fact, the standard seems to be removing the first five words. I'll get to that in a second. But one thing I was thinking about is, I mean, that seems like a very bad idea. Um, so I, I mean, I, I studied psychology. You don't need to study psychology to think about this though, but in, in psychology, people talk about primacy and recency effects. So the things that people that typically people remember are the openings of things and the endings of things and the middle kind of gets left out. So chopping off either the first or the last, psychologically speaking, not that our neuro in mean, our deep learning networks have to have like psychological realism, seems like it could be kind of a bad idea. Uh, it seems like actually kind of like the worst, the worst idea you could have. Um, so the one thing that I thought of, and I've never seen anyone do this, um, but it's just get rid of stop words until you reach L. Um, and then only, only then would you start cutting away the content. And so, um, Sean, that's like, you're talking about, a, it seemed like you're gonna go to like a sentiment analysis type thing. And so, yeah, you could um, definitely, I mean, that, that seems like to me, what would be a best practice? Um, Cause it's kind of one of these things where everything's a trade off. There's no optimal, I mean, sorry. There's no perfect solution. So the optimal solution is going to have some downside. And so mine would be get rid of stop words. Um, anyway, but that's not what we're going to do today. Um, does that uh, answer your question to any degree of satisfaction? Yeah, there is, um, there is an effect and primacy <laughs> answers my, yeah, because you, you, you even answer it, yeah. Yeah, um, but like I, I'm sure I'm sure that people who are real practitioners have thought about this more deeply than I have and have solutions. Um, okay, so that's truncation, um, but that's only one side of the, you know, having a fixed number. If that's a, 
uh, that, that metaphor is going to get really mixed up. If that's the coin, there's one side, the truncation side, and the other side of the coin is what if a document has fewer than L words? Um, so in that case, we do something called zero padding. And so the idea is that we just, as kind of placeholders for absent words or words that weren't there, we just put in a bunch of zeros. Um, and the idea here, and this is uh, from the book, zeros are an empty non-informative value. And so I don't know, so I mean, that's probably, I don't have much to say about it, but there's the same question um, as before is where do we put those zeros? And um, pre and post as before are the, the defaults. Um, uh, and go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm also thinking of ahead, thinking about contextual language models um, all these kind of pre-processing, trying to understand to cut, they understand everything uh, we given the context. So um, I'm not sure like um, in such kind of models, um, uh, like for example, bad based model, all those kind of large language models, um, this kind of thing may help. I, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, but be, uh, at the basic level, um, not large language models may help, but exploring those things i'm not sure if these kind of things uh, may help what do you think uh well i mean um so and i guess there's kind of like an an engineering answer that this just has to be done like if we like just for the way these models are built like we have to choose an l you have to choose a document length there's no there's no way around it um and then, so, I don't know, we just have to deal with it. These are just ways of, of dealing with having a fixed document length. Um, but yeah, I mean, then the value, well, actually, I mean, one thing that's kind of, I, I don't know if I should say like disappointing about this book is that usually these models don't end up doing that well uh, compared to, um, I mean, no, 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 they, they do fine, but they don't do like spectacular when you compare them to like a uh, support vector machine or something, so. And then those are like bag of words based models, basically. We're actually gonna see a bag, I don't know if we'll see it today, but there, we will do a, a bag of words model uh, here. Okay, I'm gonna go through this a little bit. So um, just to be concrete about this. So we saw the character distribution earlier. Um, here's the distribution of words. Um, and so you see this, and so, the way that this is presented in the book is that you kind of, you look at this and you decide uh, very impressionistically, uh, I guess, uh, like how long L should be. So really, I guess one thing to remark upon is that L is really a hyperparameter. Like we can set that just like you would set any other, I don't know, like a, a learning rate in uh, boosted trees or something. Um, so I think that's really how you should think of it. Um, but in the book, I think they just, if I'm not mistaken, they choose 30. They choose a really high number um, given this, this distribution. So one thing that I actually did because I am a fun person is I, I wrote a little function that shows you as for each L you can possibly choose how many zeros you introduce and how many words you truncate. So that's what this all this does. So I hope that this works because I wrote it last night. Yeah, it works. Okay. Um, so yeah, so this is, I call it the zero slash truncation trade-off. It's not a slash, I'm aware of that. The, the zero truncation trade-off at different document lengths. And so what this is, is, and notice these are pretty big numbers. There's a million, right? Or sorry, 600,000 right there. Um, and you can see as the document length goes up, what happens is that the number of words we're truncating goes down but the number of zeros we're introducing uh, goes up. And so, um, I like I said, I think that they made it 30. What do you think? Yeah, just, Justin, I'm not sure I understand. Uh, okay. Let me do this. Okay, there. So, okay, so what, what is this? Um, so let's say that we set, so remember, so we need to have all of our documents have the same number of words. So, Let's just, I'm just gonna pick 20. Yeah, I'll pick 20. I was seeing if there are any nice numbers, but no, I'll pick 30. Okay, so at 30, 
if, if we set L at 30, that means that, you know, this red point, this red point means that we're basically not truncating any words. We're not, we're not cutting any words from the documents and the whole data set, like across the entire data set. But we are introducing, what is that? Is that 10 million or 1 million? 1 million. Yeah. My eyes are like glazing over the number of zeros, but yes, but we're introducing 1 million zero zeros in the documents. So what this is showing is that as a function of the document length that we choose, again, because it's like a hyperparameter, there are gonna be some number of words that we truncate and some number of zeros that we introduce. And so this shows at each of those integers, both of those numbers. So for example, um, to belabor this for just one last little bit. So there's like a conversation happening right outside my door. Um, so for example, if we were to choose 20 instead of 30, um, you know, now we're truncating this number of, of words. Um, so somewhere less than half of 250,000, um, but we're introducing far fewer zeros. And so, you know, um, I don't know how you want to trade off against truncating versus introducing zeros. But one thing that you can think about is that, you know, between each integer, there's like a, a, a marginal increase. And you can see that, you know, at, at the beginning, so at lower document lengths, the sort of marginal, you know, the marginal penalty and zero padding is a slower, I think it's a slower kind of slope. Um, and then it eventually gets to like a pretty steady pace. It becomes basically linear once you get to going from, I guess, uh, what would this be, 20, 22, and 23? It becomes basically linear. Um, and then here, anyway, I don't know. I don't have any, uh, any Okay. Go, go ahead. Yeah. So the trade-off you're talking about, um, um, do you try to um, maybe experiment with maybe 20 and 30 to see the trade-off? Um, you just say? So, I mean, I mean, I think ultimately what you would do is just run the model with L at different values. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, but the, the nice thing about this graph, I think, um, again, I have no idea if anyone would actually do this, but is that you can see what's happening. Like, let, let's say that, you know, you find out maybe surprisingly that, I don't know, uh, you do um, like a, a grid search, right? And you find out that uh, your model with uh, 287 is the best. Like just, you know, that's not what I found, but let's say that you find that. Then that would be interesting to know that like you basically can introduce a lot of zeros uh, and not really be, I mean, the benefit from 26 to 27 and like how many fewer words you're truncating is like very little, it's a very small gain relative to how many yeah. zeros are increasing. And that would, that would be an interesting thing to know. And you would kind of find out that way empirically, um, yeah. sort of a theoretically, that the cost of introducing zeros is less than the cost of truncating words, which would make sense. Um, but anyway. Yeah. So um, this thing really makes sense because like uh, I was trying to do something. Um, what happened, like uh, we do a tax for sentiment analysis and it turns out that um, when the tweet becomes longer, people find it so confusing to give it a particular level and also the model confused. For example, um, the, when the tweet is longer, it may have positive and negative word in it. And people confuse to give it whether this is more strongly positive or more strongly negative. But if the tweet, the, the length of the tweet is short, it is pretty negative or positive because it may not contain uh, different kind of positive or negative one in it, right? So we try um, to see whether um, the, this is maybe, so we take the whole tweets and now try to find the mean of the tweet and now try to do sentiment analysis for those tweets that the lens, the, take the lens, the lens of the, the mean of the whole tweets, the lens, and now we try to do sentiment analysis on those with lens that is less than the mean and those with the length that is greater than the mean. And we have not yet, um, I'm just having the idea to do that, try to see whether the size of the text will have effect on the performance of the model. Yeah, so this something relates to what I'm thinking as well. Yeah, I, I assume it would. 
uh, have an effect. Um, I mean, yeah, yes. Um, but for better or worse, uh, we're not gonna be doing sentiment analysis here. I don't think we do sentiment analysis at all in the next three chapters. So that's a bit of a bummer, I suppose. But let me know if you are able to apply anything that we learn here to, uh, to that. Um, all right. Um, so definitely not gonna finish today, but um, okay. So this is something kind of new. This was something that confused me when I was learning about it. Um, and so hopefully I can convey it to you in a way that will uh, save you both time if this is not something that you're aware of. So, okay. So we're gonna do something called one hot encoding. Now, um, you are probably familiar, or at least have heard of, of one hot encoding. Um, and so my impression of one hot encoding was, it's just dummy variables. That's what we would call it in the, the social sciences. So it's the, uh, anyway. So, so the dummy variables that indicate the presence of something. And, um, and so, okay, so, and I think that is actually how one-hot encoding is, is used for categorical features in a lot of, um, a lot of models. But it's a little bit different in this case. So I'm just gonna go through this. Um, so they have this, I think, nice example in the book where they're gonna have uh, sort of an invented um, data set. Um, it's a nice little toy data set. Um, and so it's just these four titles of games. Um, and then they're gonna, we're gonna process it and, and see what happens. Okay, so there's just a recipe. Um, so that's a parsnip thing. And so we're gonna process the text from the small, small data. data. Uh, we tokenize it. And then we do this uh, sequence one hot, right? So sequence is important because that's what we're doing, we're getting sequences. Okay, so what happens? So in this step, when we prep the model, what it does, um, what this sequence does is basically creates, the way you can think of it is it kind of creates a dictionary. Um, and uh, I, I don't know, if, I don't think it's super relevant. It happens to be an alpha, well, it will create an alphabet, alphabetical dictionary like most, <laughs> like most dictionaries. Um, and then so each word, so each, um, they call it anyway. This isn't; these aren't really tokens in the same sense. So, like these are tokens, but once they're in a dictionary, they're not really tokens anymore. That, that just occurred to me. But okay. But so anyway, the point is that each word gets assigned a number. So we have that, and that's like this dictionary that gets created. But what will the data actually look like? Like when we pass this to a model, right? We're not going to pass the dictionary to the model. We're going to pass the data to the model. So with that, we use, we, we have the same prep. So that's just what happens here, um, which creates the dictionary among other things. But we also apply it, this recipe, we apply it to the raw data, to the unstructured data. And this is what we get. So um, unfortunately, these are called text. These are not the text. These are, um, these are the features. So this is like feature one, feature two, feature three. And these are the texts, really, one, two, three, four. And so you can see quite a bit of, of what happens here. And this was also the cause of my confusion is because I thought, oh, one hot encoding, that's dummies, right? And so you'll notice that if we, these were dummy coded, there would not be 14, there would not be four, right? Like there would be zeros and ones. And so what this is, is actually a, this is something we've talked about before, but when you have sparse, um, data, um, like a sparse matrix, like we've been dealing with all uh, this whole time, except for when we learned about word uh, vector embeddings, um, is that the most efficient way to do that, the most efficient way to uh, represent that is not in a, in a matrix where you have a bunch of zeros and ones, but you have like, you know, 99 times the zeros that you have of ones. The most efficient way to represent that is to just record um, the locations of the non-zero entries in that. And so that's basically what this is doing. So for example, 
um, what this what this means is so what these zeros mean is that there are no words here, and what this means is that the, like the first word is present in the fourth slot for the first text. So that was a lot of a lot of indexing. So first text, fourth word, in yes no yes, in the fourth slot appears the first word in the dictionary. So you see adventure, and so you can actually read off this. You can say one four five. There's that sequence. So it's adventure dice game. And sure enough, adventure dice game. So that's what that is. Now, the crazy thing is that these are really referring to long vectors. So this is really saying like in a, in a really long vector, it's the fourth, uh, you know, the fourth entry, the fourth element that is a one. So that's what I was referring to earlier is that these are a way of representing, in this case, like sparse vectors. So this is saying the first element is a one. This is saying that the fourth element is a one. This is saying that the fifth element is a one. So anyway, so that's what this one hot sequence encoding is. That's what our data, the data that we give to the model is gonna be this. And a couple of things to note here. Um, yeah, so I have some rhetorical questions. Um, some other things to note are the padding and truncation that happen. So um, notice up here that we've specified that the sequence length will be six. So what that means is that for these first three that have respective lengths of three, three, and four, um, we need to zero pad. And so you'll see that the default, because yeah, so the default is to pre-pad. So because there are, we need, we need six, we need a length of six. There are only three words. We get three zeros leading off here. For the first two, we get two here. Okay. And then for the last one, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven words. And so in six slots, so only one of them, um, or sorry, one word gets lopped off. We see here that eight is I. So eight is the last word represented. So we do have I. So it's monsters that is not going to appear. Um, so anyway, so there's a, now uh, a couple dogs fighting. Um, so a lot of noise by me today. Um, anyway, so that's what our data is going to look like. So there's padding, truncation, one hot sequence encoding. A lot happened there. Um, and I'm not actually going to run this. It's not, I might as well, why not? Um, so we can get different results. I mean, this is pre-padding, but post-truncating. So notice now that we have a two here where we had an eight here, right? So we can specify these differently. So we can pre-pad, post-truncate, or we can do a post for both. Um, but again, the default is to pre-pad and pre-truncate. That was a lot. Um, okay. So when it comes time to actually do this, um, we can, um, well, we have to uh, do the following. We have to specify, and this is something that we haven't talked about uh, today anyway, um, is that there's a max words argument we can pass to token filter. And what that does is, so when you tokenize all the words, it's going to um, just choose in this case, the, what, 20,000. I think that they said it lower, maybe at 10,000. Um, all right. Bye. Um, sorry, I was reading the comments. Um, go ahead, Sean. Um, so, Justin, and do we have much to go so that uh, maybe uh, we can stop at model architecture to see um, maybe in the next, or we can finish the whole session? What do you think? Uh, no, I think we, we should we should stop. At, I'll finish this in the next three minutes, and we'll, then we'll okay, model cool, cool, architecture cool. next week, okay. or actually, okay. I guess on Friday of this week. Yep. Can you go up a little bit, uh, Justin, um, where you explain this pre and post? Can you explain it again? Sure. Um, OK, thank you. So so. OK, so I'll focus on, on truncating right now. Um, so notice how we have um, in, the, in the raw data, the unstructured text, this last title, it has seven words. 
So monsters, ghosts, goblins, me, myself, and I. So there are seven words there. But we specified that we want a sequence length of six. So, you know, one of those words is going to sadly have to not be in the data set. Um, and just given the way that uh, these things go, it's either going to be it's either going to be monsters or I. Again, we we've already discussed you know how maybe that's not the best idea, but that's what that's the choice we have. Um, ah, I, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I got it already. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it, so if we do pre truncating, uh, mm -hmm. we yeah that's it. So if we do pre truncating, it's monsters yeah. that leave. If we do post truncating, it's I. That okay. Leaves. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Justin. Yeah. Um, and then so independent of the sequence length, we can choose basically the dictionary length. And like I was saying, I think that they set it to 10,000 or yeah, 10,000. I put it to 20,000. I don't, I didn't, cause I don't really understand why we would. A anyway, we'll, we'll get to that. Cause anyway. So, so you are limiting the dictionary that you're going to train the whole model. Is that correct? uh yeah yes what okay okay is it a parameter for the model to be used or what or is just a kind of pre-processing still it is it is a pre-processing step um so so before um and and earlier models when we were creating a document term matrix and using like a lasso regression or something um, the reason we would set a maximum token, like the reason we would, okay, because we, we've used in previous lessons, we've used this function before step token filter. Um, and the reason we would use that is to um, basically reduce the dimensionality of the data set. So, because uh, the, uh -huh. so the okay. number of Entries in our dictionary is the number of features in our model, and right, and just in general, all okay. things equal. You want to reduce the number of features. So, if that's helpful. So, so do we have the maximum number of particular word to appear in the whole corpus so that we limit that thing or what? Exactly. Yeah, we we limit the corpus basically. So, we, so uh -huh. for, for example, um, you say now maximum to be like two ish four. Now, how do you determine that a particular word will be part of this stuff or not? Um, so the way that it gets in there is it will actually um, rank them to the most prevalent 20,000 in this case. So, uh -huh, so mm, I see, I yeah. see, I see. So I was thinking about um, where we do um, this, uh, our stuff, what is it called that we create document term matrix? We say, okay, give us something that appears maybe at least 10 times in the whole document. Yeah. That appears 20 times at least. Give anything, truncate everything that doesn't appear at least 20 times in the document. So here, when you give, we give the maximum number. Okay. Yeah, maybe I can. I actually don't know what help file is going to look like. Okay, so step token filter. So, so this is what. So these are the different ways we can do it. Notice here, we've got this. So we can say the maximum number of times it appears. And this is what you were saying, the minimum number of times we need at least 10 yeah. appearances. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, sure. Uh -huh. Okay. And so percentages, so mm -hmm. there are, are four different uh, filters that we can, or four different ways, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, oh, that's nice, percentage, yeah. So this is the way, I've actually seen this one probably the most where if a, a given word appears in over 99% or 97%, they'll be, mm -hmm. it'll be also if it appears in less than 1%, it'll be removed or 2%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, they, they use max tokens. So, okay. So, yeah, so that's how step token filter works. And oh, I think I can actually, we'll, we'll leave it there and we'll start with, um, so this, this will create the, the data matrix and um, next week or next session, um, we'll start talking about the actual deep learning architecture. Okay, cool.
that makes sense um so um i was thinking like um uh yeah the best thing is try to process to to give your model the best data uh well uh, processed so that it can make sense so it takes a lot of you know effort here to put the data in best shape so that the model can do well right yeah it takes a lot of uh a lot of effort i mean so and i guess another thing is that all these are so ideally what we would want to do is try out we would we would create a grid of max length so the sequence yeah. length mm -hmm. and max words mm -hmm. and um and fit a bunch of models there yeah so that's one and then with the model architecture uh actually i mean there are a lot of things that you could consider hyperparameters but we'll see we'll see at least one more so yeah it'll be it'll get complicated <laughs> yeah yeah so um yeah i was thinking like um uh, they were saying like uh, in machine learning we engineer the future right like uh, in classical ml we engineer the future to make it the classical ml to understand better but what they are saying like in deep learning um, you don't actually engineer the future a lot. I'm not sure, but here we are trying to engineer the future, right? To give the models the best way to learn from it. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah, there is the, yes, that is the idea of, of deep learning is that the, mo the model will create the features that, that uh, we want. Um, I'm trying to think. So in this case, you know, um, there's very little talk of, so I mean, but okay, we could have supplied the model when we tokenized, right? Um, we could have supplied it, the model with um, bigrams, for example. So there is, there are decisions as to what we give the model, for sure. Um, but yeah, so that, that is a good point is that, yes, people talk about feature engineering much more mm. than learning, but I mean, we do have to make some pretty important decisions here. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. I really enjoyed the session, just uh, Justin. It's it's really um, interesting. <laughs> yeah, and thank you for the wonderful and good presentation. You really takes time to you know explain this thing thoroughly and uh, in a layman's uh, perspective. <laughs> thank you for that, Justin. Yeah. Well, I hope I hope I do. Well, next time discussing the architecture, but we'll see. Yeah, I really enjoyed this session, man. <laughs> really, very, very exciting. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm especially this idea you are talking about uh, about this land. Um, is something really that uh, I may even try to see how um it works. Yeah, yeah, and sa sadly, it's something that they don't really go into in the in the book. They, I mean, they discuss. They say that it's a choice you have to make, but they don't go into they don't talk about this trade-off at all really yeah this is something really really interesting justin um i would try to see um uh, how it goes the performance with this idea you bring i'm, I'm really grateful for this yeah okay all right well i'm glad all right well we've gone over time so i'll yeah. okay sign so, off but i'll see, see you on friday okay bye bye bye